Okay, our first speaker this evening is astrophysicist Dr. Gordon Folks. Dr. Folks holds a bachelor's, master's, and PhD all in physics from the University of Chicago. Over the last 40 years, he has worked both in academia and in think tank world environments, studying a wide range of subjects from cosmic radiation to nuclear weapons effects. Pretty interesting stuff. He's even worked one summer for Professor um, Ted Fujita, AKA Mr. Tornado, and, and on mesoscale meteorology. His work with global warming is entirely pro bono, including numerous op-eds for the Oregonian. He's an avid mountaineer who twice climbed to the 500 millibar level, that's about 18,000 feet above sea level, uh, in Mexico and Africa, and has climbed the last 1,500 feet on Mount St. Helens that no one will ever climb again. <laughs> Interesting. Do Dr. Dr. Folks is the son of Joe Folks, who was a fellow AMS member and member of this very chapter. Uh, actually, let me back up there. Joe Folks, who was a fellow in the AMS and member of this very chapter, I believe he also worked for the National Weather Service, correct? Yes, yeah, so he was out of Chicago. Excellent, he was out of Chicago. All right. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gordon Folks. Thanks, Steve, for inviting us. The title of my talk, which is not the approved title, uh, actually comes from an Oregonian uh, headline writer. It was the title of my first op-ed in the Oregonian. That was really the only op-ed where they gave me uh, the sort of title that I liked. Um, what was originally envisioned here as a low-key scientific meeting to discuss an important topic of wide interest has now become an event that will be watched around the world. The establishment and the promotion of global warming decreed in November that this meeting would not occur because we three senior scientists did not meet their standards. That was a compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cancellation of meetings has become a standard tactic of warmers who not only find themselves pressed to explain a cooling climate when their computer codes repeatedly predict a warming one, but also completely unable to present any observed climate signature from the gradually increasing carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Instead of admitting this, warmers promote carbon dioxide as an all-purpose all explanation. A Greenpeace activist explained it so succinctly, global warming can mean colder, it can mean wetter, it can mean drier. That's what we're talking about. You might think that warmers would disavow such nonsense, but they do not. Uh, there was even an article in Physics Today recently entitled, Global Warming Could Cause Colder Winters, and it was written by a PhD meteorologist, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Science like climate is ever-changing. That is why scientific meetings like we're having today are important. A few years ago, most people, uh, including virtually all physicians, believed that peptic ulcers were caused by stress. Today, thanks to the work of two dedicated Australian researchers, we know for sure that a bacterium is involved. When Barry Marshall and Robin Warren were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2005, the Nobel Committee noted the battle they had waged against the bad behavior of their colleagues who vigorously defended uh, what the presenter called prevailing dogmas. In climate science, we have a similar situation amplified many times, not only by those in authority at institutions like the National Academy of Sciences, but by those ordinary scientists defending their research grants, by university administrators eager to stay on the vast federal gravy train, by politicians who have built their reputations and agendas around an absolute correctness of anthropogenic global warming, by a host of crony capitalists who've been lured into supporting cures for our imagined climate ills by a vast array of subsidies, and by a large number of ordinary citizens who are easily dazzled by those in authority because they lack education in science and be because they see this as a new secular religion of environmentalism. Somewhere in the middle is our large and powerful institution, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. All it took to send them into a panic were a few phone calls from prominent professors at Oregon universities to remind them that we three musketeers might present heretical thoughts on global warming that might challenge their majority view. What sort of catastrophe are warmers promoting? Are we to be burning in hell by the end of the century as if condemned to the netherworld in Dante's Inferno? 
Or are they just worried about a milder winter with less valley snow? Are they worried about a return of another Columbus Day storm or another Hurricane Katrina, the melting of the Greenland ice cap and the Arctic sea ice, or just the remaining glaciers on Mount Hood? Or are they worried that you might come to your senses and no longer support their insatiable appetite for research grants? The answer, of course, is all of these and anything else that they think is scary. For them, it's Halloween all year long. This topic has become a catch-all for hysteria, largely because we have let it become so, not because there's really very much to worry about. Uh, now let's turn to the science, where we need to be very clear as to what, scientific, to what the scientific topic is tonight. We're addressing the supposition that human emissions of carbon dioxide are warming the Earth's climate, climate in a significant way. This is the so-called global warming. The argument against global warming is so extraordinarily simple and so powerful that we often forget to state it. There is no satisfactory logic and evidence linking human emissions of carbon dioxide to a significant warming of our climate. None. Let me say that again. None. There's plenty of evidence that our climate is changing and that it always has and always will change. Climate simulations that we see a lot of are not proof of anything any more than the wonderful simulations in Star Wars are accurate predictions of what life will be like in the future. They are just exercises in imagination. Real science is more than a good story, more than a tall tale, and more than a Hollywood movie. It requires rigorous logic and evidence. Absent that logic and evidence, theories remain just that, theories. After spending an incredible $100 billion looking for that evidence, it would be prudent to assume that the actual carbon dioxide effect is small and divert our taxpayer money to more pressing priorities. As an example of how good science really works, consider the efforts of Danish physicist Hendrik Svensmark to solve the cloud mystery. His hypothesis is that the variable flux of galactic cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere causes a variable cloud cover. Extremely energetic cosmic rays cause water vapor to condense in the saturated air, although each cosmic ray, typically a single proton that has come across the galaxy, leaves only a tiny wake of water droplets. The cumulative effect of many cosmic rays and their shower of secondary particles result in clouds that change the albedo or reflectivity of the Earth and hence its temperature. While this is an interesting and plausible theory, it could have exactly the same problem as the man-made carbon dioxide theory, a minor net effect on our climate. But unlike carbon dioxide, this climate driver has not been studied in significant detail so far. Now, one reason I bring this up is that many years ago, I worked on the explanation for the varying cosmic ray flux of galactic cosmic rays. The theory goes like this. The sun's outer atmosphere is boiled off in a supersonic solar wind that blows past the Earth at 400 kilometers per second. That's a million miles an hour. This wind is a superconducting plasma that has frozen within it the magnetic fields that we can measure from the surface of the sun. Because the sun rotates as the solar wind moves radially outward, the magnetic field becomes a giant spiral field. It continues to spread out until its magnetic pressure matches that of the interstellar magnetic field. Uh, the uh, laminar flow of the solar wind becomes turbulent, and the solar magnetic field merges with the interstellar field. Incoming galactic cosmic rays are deflected by the spiral magnetic field and become coupled to it. Once coupled, they spiral, spiral inward, sometimes hitting irregularities that can alter their forward progression or even reverse it. Of course, as this is going on, the solar wind is convecting the magnetic field and the cosmic rays attach to it out of the solar system. Whether or not they ever reach the inner solar system where we live uh, and, and the Earth depends on the detailed balance of inward diffusion against outward convection. Because of the com complexity of this process, I was careful to step back to a very basic argument linking the sun to the variable flux of galactic cosmic rays in research that was published quite a while ago in the Journal of Geophysical Research. This plot shows the substantial anti-correlation between a galactic cosmic ray measurement, in this case from the Climax Colorado Neutron Monitor, and a solar index smoothed Zurich sunspot numbers. Anti-correlation just means that one goes up when the other goes down. Now, this establishes that they are closely linked with one likely causing the other. 
The plot contains one of the very important secrets of the solar system almost as plain as day. The cosmic ray index lags the solar index by about two-thirds of a year. Realizing that this must be the time that it takes the sun to communicate the solar cycle to the solar system, and knowing the measured speed of the solar wind, I calculated a radius for the heliosphere of about 50 astronomical units, one astronomical unit being the distance from the Earth to the sun. That was vastly larger than others believed at the time, and I was advised uh, quite pointedly not to anger those who thought that the heliosphere was small. What I did was what all good scientists do. I acknowledged the arguments of others and presented my differing logic. But what settled the issue? It was certainly not the peer review process that allowed both arguments to be published, but by actual measurements. Twenty years later, an American spacecraft, actually several of them, but uh, there was one that did it first, radioed over eight billion miles home in the longest long distance call in the history of man that had finally reached the boundary of the solar system at 80 astronomical units, well beyond even what I said. Uh, this is how disputes in real science are settled by real evidence. That's very important to remember. While we're considering astrophysical effects on climate, let's not ignore a huge one. You typically will not see photos of Jupiter in a discussion of climate, but there is little doubt that Jupiter has a profound effect on the Earth's climate. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, weighing in at more than twice as much as all the other planets combined. The Earth would easily fit in the famous red spot you see. In fact, about seven Earths would fit in the red spot. The red spot is a giant hurricane of sorts that has lasted for at least four centuries. The banding of Jupiter's clouds is an indication that different latitudes rotate at different angular speeds, something not possible if the planet were a solid. I remember one time I got after the Oregonian for saying that the surface of Jupiter is a very scary place. What's scary is it has no surface. Uh, <laughs> Jupiter is also about twice as warm as it should be for the amount of solar radiation that it gets. This is attributed to its constant slow shrinkage. What does Jupiter have to do with the Earth's climate? There is little doubt that it has a major influence over millennia and perhaps even over centuries. The easiest way to understand the importance of Jupiter is to look at temperature reconstructions from the ice core proxies. This sequence of charts places the global temperature increase over the last two centuries in perspective and helps us to understand what the future holds for planet Earth. Needless to say, these charts suggest a future that is far different from what alarmists claim. Incidentally, this is uh, uh, NOAA data. This is government data out of Greenland here. Uh, this first chart shows that our world did indeed begin to warm up from the Little Ice Age in about 1830. Extending the chart back to 800 AD shows the medieval warm period. Although ice core data does not cover the 20th century, we show with an arrow where the peak of the modern warm period will likely fall when the ice consolidates in, another, in, in a number of decades. It will be lower than the medieval peak. We know that for a number of reasons. Going back still further, we see a succession of warm periods spaced at roughly 1,200 year intervals, each less warm than the one that preceded it. During the Roman Warm Period, the great Carthaginian general Hannibal was able to march war elephants across the Alps to attack the Romans. Such a feat is not possible in our latest Warm Period because of the year-round snow in the mountain passes. Going back 11,000 years through the entire history of this interglacial period known as the Holocene Climate Optimum, the present climate change is utterly negligible. Note that human civilization developed during this warm period. We tend to like warm periods rather than cold periods. Going back 13,000 years, we see a much different era. What is that much colder period? It's an ice age, which lasted about 90,000 years. Note that ice ages have much more dramatic temperature swings uh, than the benign interglacials. Our recent temperature swing is utterly negligible in this context. Note also that the temperature during the Holocene trended downward as we progress through the Milankovitch cycle that causes the Earth's closest approach to the sun to move from July to where it is now in January. For the entire ice core record, you have to go to Vostok, Antarctica, uh, where, they, where it goes back 450,000 years. The very regular pattern of ice ages lasting about 90,000 years, followed by an interglacial lasting about 10,000 years, were explained by the Serbian physicist Milutin Milankovic. 
question, what causes the small variations in the Earth's orbit about the Sun? That's right, the huge planet Jupiter. And tidal forces caused by the Sun and the Moon change the Earth's orbit just enough to bring about dramatic climate variations. Before I hear objection from, objections from OMSI supporters, let me point out that my fellow astrophysicist James Hansen and I agree about Milankovitch cycles, as do most other scientists. That does not assure that this explanation will never be challenged, but it does indicate that it has broad support across the spectrum of global warming opinion. Why is this? Milankovitch was able to prove his assertions with rigorous calculations of the various gravitational effects involved. Because global warming touches on so many topics, can we narrow them down? From the standpoint of climate alarmists, the critical issue is none other than a catastrophe of great proportions, ultimately involving the survival of man and of the planet. This is complete nonsense. What we find, in contrast, is a profound ignorance of science, even how science works. In one study, half the graduates of Harvard University could not correctly say why the seasons change. This is not a matter of memorization, but a matter of basic curiosity about a fundamental scientific process important to everyone, should be of interest to everyone, too. For the Argonian editorial board that I deal with occasionally and physicist Richard Mueller, the central issue was the warming over the 20th century. But that's a bogus issue also because most scientists agree that this warming of about eight-tenths of one degree is about eight-tenths of one degree centigrade. Similarly, there is no dispute that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which is much less important than the main greenhouse and climate gas water vapor. It may also surprise you to know that there is a little dispute as to the warming possible from a doubling of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The dispute arises when we consider consequences or feedbacks of this warming. Alarmists point to a strong positive water vapor feedback while skeptics maintain that our climate system is inherently stable against such perturbations because of negative feedbacks. Chuck Weiss will address this in a good deal more detail than I am here. Most scientists who are aware of the global temperature data agree that we saw an increase after the great Pacific climate shift of 1977. Uh, since 1977, was moderated by several huge volcanic eruptions until they ceased in the late 1990s. Thereafter, the global temperature has fluctuated with essentially no trend. When climate alarmists cannot talk about the logic and the data, they often try to question our scientific credentials or imply that we're in the, in the employ of the oil companies. These are bogus issues. My thesis tonight is simple. Virtually all of what climate alarmists put forth as science is not. Some is half correct, some is incorrect, and too much is just plain nonsense or worse. One of the central problems with anthropogenic global warming is the integrity of the data. This was certainly brought to our attention by the East Anglia emails of ClimateGate fame, but goes well beyond the very bad behavior discovered there. Here is one of the latest examples purporting to show a, steadily, a steady rise in the global temperature since 1973. Climate alarmists have been stunned by the leveling off of the temperature trend over the last 13 years because it goes so strongly against their climate models. Although what you see here is touted as representative of the global temperature, it is merely a compilation and correction of surface temperature data of dubious quality. Note their misuse of the labels skeptic and realist. Here in contrast, is the gold standard for global temperature measurements. Oh, these come from the microwave sounding units on NASA satellites and show amazing detail that is easily correlated with significant climate events like El Nino's, La Nina's, and volcanic eruptions. In contrast to the surface data used by warmers that covers mostly land areas, the NASA satellite data covers a large portion of the entire globe. It is amazing that the global temperature is only about a tenth of a degree centigrade above the 30-year average as of the end of last year and has been uh, falling because of La Nina conditions in the eastern Pacific. The preliminary data I've seen this month suggests another precipitous drop to below the 30-year average. In any case, we're right in there, very close to average. Why do most warmers insist on using inferior measurements to uh, compile a global temperature? Here is one reason. Urban areas are known to be warmer than the surrounding countryside because of all the concrete and steel and because of limited vegetation. This study shows that the temperature has indeed been rising sharply in the most heavily populated uh, um, or heavily urbanized counties in California, but hardly at all in rural counties. 
Hence, any inclusion of temperature data from areas that have seen rapid development will be biased toward warmer temperatures. Such temperature rises are a measurement of development, not global warming. Even the U.S. historical climatological network has enormous biases toward higher temperatures because some sensors have been located too close to heat producing or trapping structures. Those are pictures from Anthony Watts that are, uh, uh, show some of the problems, terrible problems. These known problems have become a reason for processing raw temperature data to supposedly address the problems. But unfortunately, it's been another exercise to turn cooling into warming, as the records for this California station indicate. The most famous example of what I consider outright cheating was Michael Mann's famous hockey stick graph. The central theme of all warmers is that everything started to come apart in the 20th century due to the man's burning of fossil fuels. The central piece of evidence presented is Michael Mann's hockey stick graph. This graph has had an amazing existence, rising from the ashes each time someone points out a fatal flaw. Why? Because the UNIPCC desperately needs this graph and feels that it can withstand all criticism. The Wegman report to the National Academy of Sciences did not accuse Mann of fraud, but pointed out that his results were not supportable because of serious analytical errors. The East Anglia emails re revealed that Michael Mann had used what was termed Michael's nature trick of removing tree ring data that did not support continued warming in the mid 20th century and substituting conventional thermometer records that did. The mismatched data should have told Mann that his data were not reliable, but instead they provided him exactly the result he wanted and worldwide acclaim. That has become an all too consistent pattern with those proving global warming. Here is the corrected version of the infamous hockey stick that eliminates Mike's nature trick and correctly shows the medieval warm period. Man was intent on hiding the medieval warm period to bolster, bolster his claim that we are warmer today than at any time in the past thousand years. That is simply not true. Another example of bad science, uh, or other examples are closer to home, uh, Professor Phil Mote, now of Oregon State University, but then of the University of Washington, shows his signature contribution the, to the global warming debate, an alleged uh, uh, shrinking of the low elevation northwest snowpack. Indeed, the data support his contention from the high reached in the early 1950s to the low in the 1990s. But what about before 1950 and after 1977? <laughs> Well, he did not think it was relevant to report the entire data set that shows cyclical behavior, but no real trend. You will never see this table of the worldwide record high temperatures from Alarmus because it shows that all records for the continents were set long ago. That may seem inconsistent with the fact that we are slightly warmer today than we were in the early 20th century, but it may have to do with less effective mi mixing of Arctic cold Arctic air with warm tropical air when the sun is less active. The sun gen was generally less active in the early 20th century and also recently. Some temperature records say that we need to be careful about generalities that may not apply to every location. The temperature data for Paris shows the city was warmer in the 1750s and 1830s than today. But also note that the, the temperature dip around the time of the French Revolution when Frenchmen were starving due to the refusal of the ruling class to adapt to climate change by switching from growing wheat to growing potatoes. This brings me to my uh, one political bit of political advice for the evening. Politicians should not lose their heads over climate change. <laughs> I got a Republican politician really angry with that comment. <laughs> Because our oceans contain the vast majority of mobile heat on the planet, much of the climate drama plays out there. Climate models consistently predict a steadily rising ocean heat content, but data from the extensive Argo array of deep sea diving buoys tells a much different story. Al Gore loves to tout rising sea levels as one of the dire consequences of global warming. This satellite data would would seem to confirm his thoughts, at least as to a modest rise since 2006. But what is wrong? The Swedish scientist Nils Axel Morner points out the scam here. Satellite altimetry shows no sea level rise until unexplained personal calibrations are applied to the data in line with climate models. Basically, they just tilted the record up to match their models. 
What Mourner does is uh, uh, draw the line here you see in blue. This is the sea level trend based on simple tide gauges, none of the complex stuff, none of the modern satellites, just simple tide gauges that show no appreciable changes in half a century in blue. Note how different this is from the steady rise claimed by alarmists. Now this doesn't take into account rising or subsiding coastlines, which are frequent in many areas, but that's not rising sea, le sea level, that's changing in the coastline. Carbon dioxide appears to be another swindle. Here are the famous infrared measurements of carbon dioxide from Hawaii. So far, so good. Here is the way the UN IPCC marries the ice core derived atmospheric carbon dioxide levels to, modern, to the modern instrument record. What they do not tell you is that they've arbitrarily moved the ice core proxy records to the right by 80 years and another arbitrary adjustment to make the plot you see pleasantly continuous. What is the scientific justification for that? Essentially none. While the ice cores provide an excellent temperature proxy, they are also uh, a far more problematical proxy for ancient atmospheres. The assumption that they trap a pristine sample of the ancient atmosphere is likely not true, especially for a gas like carbon dioxide that dissolves in water. The other assumption that the ice cores continue to trap the ancient gases as they are removed in a rather brutal fashion from the glacier and the drilling process is also questioned. What is notably missing from the UN IPCC plot of the atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 200 years? Well, what is missing? Uh, all of the measurements made by chemical techniques, uh, basically for over 200 years. Here is a compilation of those from the late German scientist Ernst Georg Beck. Note that his compilation meshes well with the modern IR measurements, but shows much more structure to the measurements prior to 19, 1960. The peak near 1940 follows the warmer period we call in the United States the Dust Bowl. This peak was higher than the levels that alarmists complain about today. Note that Beck lists the researchers involved and references Hundert Mayer, hundreds more. Several were no Nobel laureates in chemistry. If the chemical measurements are correct, and we have little reason to doubt them, they indicate that the, that the dynamics of atmospheric carbon dioxide are much more complex than most believe today, and that levels were notably higher in the recent past. How is this possible, given our greater burning of fossil fuels today than in the 1940s? The oceans also contain the vast majority of mobile carbon dioxide on this planet. Human emissions, while not completely insignificant, are small compared with the amounts naturally in play. Global sea ice, frequently claimed to be disappearing by alarmists, continues to follow a regular seasonal pattern, just as it has for the past 30 years of detailed satellite observations. This comes from a very interesting site, if you don't know about it, Cryosphere Today, which is available on the web and uh, is um, maintained by the University of Illinois. At the present, this shows uh, 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 that the, sea, the total sea ice is a little below average for this time of year in the Arctic and a little above normal in the Antarctic. The Arctic low reached in 2007 appeared to be due to slightly warmer water drawn into the Arctic Ocean from the North Atlantic by a reversal in the circulation of the Arctic Ocean. This is the net there of the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, very, very close to, to normal, actually slightly below normal, but very close. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is largely frozen today, to no surprise, and we have extensive snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere. Such an extensive snow cover has been a feature of recent winters. That would have been a better picture, incidentally, if uh, the satellite that uh, we used to use hadn't failed last September. Uh, the IPCC's understanding of climate was better years ago. This is not something they will admit today. The long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. Today they believe that their climate models can do anything. But all of the extremely expensive climate models fail miserably, not only in predicting the response of the global temperature to increases in carbon dioxide, but also where the warming should be observed. If greenhouse gases were responsible for the small warming we have observed, then there should be a hot spot developing in the tropical troposphere. Without that hot spot, something else has to be driving the warming. The reality is clear, there is no hot spot and therefore no significant greenhouse warming. The computer models fail again. How can the, uh, the computer models that so many believe are correct fail so miserably? After all, they include a lot of the basic physics that we all agree upon. 
The problem is that they are simulations of reality and very far different from exact calculations of the basic physics. Exact solutions of the fundamental equations are well beyond our computer capabilities, as Professor of Theoretical Physics Gerhard Gerlich explains here. Gerlich likens the simulations to computer games, another exercise in virtual reality. In practice, programmers develop subroutines that mimic some real behavior like large-scale fluid dynamics, but substantially fail to accurately simulate many other crucial phenomena like clouds. To make up for all the shortcomings, programmers use simplifications to make the models appear to fit historical climate data. With hundreds of arbitrary parameters available to them, fitting exist existing data is relatively easy, but it also renders the codes completely unable to predict the future. The process has become hardly more than a child's game of connecting the dots. Where does the child go when he reaches the last dot? The codes have been trained to project the global temperature relentlessly upward, but that is just what their directors want and certainly not what the actual climate is doing. The well-known physicist uh, Freeman Dyson from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University once recalled a conversation with the great University of Chicago physicist Enrico Fermi. <clears throat> In desperation, I asked Fermi whether he was not impressed by the agreement between our calculated numbers and his measured numbers. He replied, how many arbitrary parameters did you use for your calculations? I thought for a moment about our cutoff procedures and said, four. He said, I remember my friend Johnny von Neumann used to say, with four parameters I can fit an elephant, and with five I can make him wiggle his trunk. With that, the conversation was over. <laughs> Another fundamental mathematical problem that most scientists fail to understand involves the concept of a global temperature. Such an artificial construct has severe limitations because there are an infinite number of temperature distributions possible for each measured global temperature. Some that involve warm tropical air bottled up near the equator are inherently cooling patterns because cooling mechanisms are very nonlinear. These mathematical arguments may seem opaque to those without mathematical training, but they are very powerful arguments that easily take down the pseudoscience of global warming. Changes in solar activity have long been known to be correlated with our climate. Here you see a picture of sunspots on the surface of the sun. These indications of intense magnetic activity have fascinated man for many centuries, and records of them go back further than any other scientific measurements. They were begun by Galileo in 1611. Here is the entire sunspot record with a prediction out to 2080. Uh, the Maunder and Dalton minimums in sunspot number correspond with especially cold periods over the centuries shown. The Maunder and Dalton, Dalton minimums you can see there. Uh, with strong evidence that the sun is now headed for another slumber, we have yet another indication of global cooling in our future. Because our oceans contain most of the mobile heat on this planet, ocean cycles are yet another strong driver of the climate. Here are Russian records for the Arctic above 70 degrees north with their prediction for the region out to 2080. Very cyclical. What does all of this tell us? The real long-term threat is global cooling. With this Holocene climate optimum winding down toward another ice age, with the sun entering another quiet period, and with the various ocean cycles heading toward their cold phase, we likely face a cooler future with the next decades to centuries with a plunge into another ice age toward the end of this millennium. What saves us from really precipitous changes is the buffering of the oceans. They contain enough mobile heat to keep us going for, for a long while. The real question in my mind, and we're coming to the end here in case Steve is wondering about the time, uh, will we be able to overpower, overcome the present hysteria and replace it with a rational assessment of where we are headed? To do that, we must reclaim science from those who, who are using it for political purposes and religious purposes. As Michael Crichton said, the greatest challenge facing mankind is the challenge of distinguishing reality from fantasy, truth from propaganda. Perceiving the truth has always been a challenge to mankind, but in the information age, or as I think of it, the disinformation age, it takes on a special urgency and importance. Professor Richard Lindzen of MIT is more direct. The need to courageously resist hysteria is clear. Finally, I come to my last slide. I will leave the last word to Albert Einstein. Thank you for listening. If you have any easy questions, I'll be happy to answer them after Chuck and George have had something to say. <laughs>